Hello, and welcome to the CCF Online channel. We are excited for you to be part of another worship experience. We pray that what you learn here today will deepen your relationship with Jesus. Enjoy the message. So there was a CNN cameraman. He was a cameraman, and by the approval of his boss, he calls a hangar to rent a twin turbojet, a small airplane. So he went to the hangar, and when he saw there, there was already a plane that was actually warming up. And so he thought that it was the plane that he rented, so he jumped in the plane, slammed the door, put it in his camera, and then said to the pilot, let's fly, let's go. And so when they're on air, they were flying, he said to the pilot, let's fly low because I'm going to take some pictures. And so the pilot said, why would you do that, sir? Because I'm a cameraman from CNN and I'd like to take some pictures in the valley. And there was silence. And the pilot said, so you mean to say, sir, you are not my flight instructor. <laughs> so, what's the lesson behind it? There are things in our life that we need to understand and identify which is which. And sometimes, as Christians, we need to also ask ourselves, who am I identified with? Who am I really? Right? Today, we're going to continue with a series that Pastor Bob started last Sunday. This is a three-Sunday series, and today is the second. And uh, we are on still focusing on a certain verse in 2 Peter chapter, or 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Let me read this to you. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So last week, if you are here for, who are here last week and heard the message, see some hands, okay, praise God. By the way, who are here for the first time? It is your first time here. One, two, three, I see some hands, praise God. Welcome, welcome to Christ Commission Fellowship. And uh, I will be your messenger boy this morning. And uh, as I have said, we have been focusing on this verse. And for next week also, we will still be of uh, uh, dealing with this verse and understand it more. Last week, Pastor Bob uh, laid down the foundation what this verse is about. And the main idea last week was this, that we, as a people, we are a community. Sabi sa verse kasi, you were once a people, but now you are a nation. Right? So we are a community. And in CCF, a small community, we call it a D-group, and we are not only just a community, but we are a community with a mission of God. And that is the whole essence of the verse. And somehow, to make it more understandable to us, the whole meaning of 1 Peter 2.9 is that we are something that we are, not merely something we do. It is something that comes from within us. It is something intrinsic. It is something that it is coming from the inside out. Not only we do things merely just we do it, but we do it because it is who we are. And that is the foundation that Pastor Bob had last week. Today, we're going to zero in into something and we're going to talk about identity. Because when the Apostle Peter wrote this, at that time, he said, But you, you, but you are. So he was addressing to a certain uh, group of audience. And the you there are the believers in Christ. Okay? The believers in Christ. Believers in a sense that they believe in Jesus, that He is God. He died and was buried and rose again. And that these believers have given their life to Him and that they have now given their life to Him because God gave His life for them. So my question to you right now is this. Are you believers of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you believe that He died on the cross and He was buried and the third day rose again for the forgiveness of your sins? Okay, it's okay kung hinay lang ang tingog. Okay. Are you believers of Jesus Christ? Yes. Amen. So meaning, this verse is also for you. 
So he says here, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. So you are part of this. So this is also addressed to all of us. And in this sense, Paul or Peter was saying, you have a certain identity. You have an identity. And this is what we're going to talk about this morning. This certain identity. We're going to answer certain questions like, who are we as people of God? Sino ba talaga tayo? Because Peter was saying, you, kayo, 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 kayo mga pinili. We're going to answer, who are we as people of God? What does it mean to be a true believer or a real question, real Christian? Also, if you are a Christian, if you are a Christian, what is unique or different about your identity? Now, if you are if you are new here, you'd probably be shocked. Oh, man, is really there a difference between true believers or just believing? Now, let me, sh- let, me, let me tell you something. In this country, the whole of the Philippines know the name Jesus Christ. Do you agree? They know that Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and rose again on the third day. Third day. Do you agree? But you know what? A true believer has a found... There's something different really when you are a real believer. And that's what I'm going to talk about this morning. There's something foundational. Something that you just couldn't say na he is not only a believer, but he really is a true Christian. Because some of us may know the name of Jesus, but it is only believing in the mind. It's only knowledge. Yes, we do believe. But a real Christian, a real believer, really embraced the truth. And that there's something that shifts from one point in this life to another that you would really say, ah, he really is a true believer of Christ. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Why am I sharing that? Because many really do say that they know Jesus. In fact, uh, in the letter of James, he says, you believe that God is one. You do well. Okay, yan. The whole of the, this country, okay, man, you believe in the name of Jesus. But believe only in mental believing. The truth is, the demons also believe and shudder. But I'm going to divulge in more on what makes someone a real Christian. What does it mean to be a real Christian? That's what I'm going to deal this morning. And Peter gave us a clue, and, P- and the Bible is giving us a, not only a clue, but a lesson that the real Christian has gone into an event in his life. And Peter says this in verse uh, chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again. Now, here is this word born again, the most hated word in the Philippines, probably in my time, in our place. They hate the word born again because they think born again is a religion. Am I right? They say, and dito na naman yung mga born again, born again na yan. Mga suwail. But you see, friends, the Apostle Peter said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us. So born again really is not religion. It is an event in our life. It is something that God caused to someone. Something became alive in someone. And Apostle Peter is saying, born again to a living hope. See friends, Ezekiel also said, the Old Testament prophet said, I will give you a what? A new heart and put a new spirit. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you 
a heart of flesh. Even in the Old Testament, you see, there's gonna, there's something's gonna happen to real believers. You see, you have an old heart, but I'm gonna give you a new heart. You have a dead spirit, but I'm gonna give you a new spirit. I will remove from your stony heart and put in a heart of flesh. Something new inside you. Something great happened inside you. And where you find your identity shapes your life. Why is it important to understand that we are identified with that? Because this principle where you find your identity share or shapes your life. There is an illustration I want to show to you. If you are actually more older than me, you probably know this story. Have you seen this movie? Nobody will admit because you're probably older than me. But this has been shown in 1980s, Chariots of Fire. This is a true story for two Englishmen who are actually very fast or they run really fast. Eric Liddell and uh, his name is Harold Abraham. Now, these two Englishmen were actually, they made a statement and they identified themselves to a certain thing and their character now is defined. Now, one is a devout Christian. His, Eric Liddell was a devout Christian. He was a son of a missionary to China. The other one is a secular Jew. And these are their statements. Harold Abraham said, I have 60 seconds to justify my existence. You know why? His identity is with the Jewish people. And Jewish people at that time were discriminated. And people thought that the Jewish are inferior. And his statement is this, I have 60 seconds to justify my existence to prove that the Jewish are superior. But this devout Christian, his, this true Christian, he said, God made me fast. When I run, I feel his pleasure. So that statement defined himself as he points himself to that identity that I do these things because I, I am identified with Christ. Understand, friends? So your identity actually where you find your identity shapes how you live your life and how you approach existence but in the new testament your new testament talking about being new okay new testament and new there are plenty of verses that tells us that god had made us new in him and the best example of this verse i I can give you today is found in 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says there, Therefore, if any man is what? Is in? In Christ. He is a new creature. The old things has passed away. Behold, the new things have come. Now, let me explain to you quickly. If anyone is in Christ. Now, the word in right there, the word in, it's, it's the meaning of that is not, you know, you are inside the church or you're inside the car. It does not speak of location. It does not speak of location such as in, in car, but carries the idea of what? Idea of union. It doesn't say if you're in Christ, meaning you are around Christ. The awareness of Christ, that's not it. When you say you are when Paul said you are, therefore, if you are in Christ, meaning there is a super bond in you within Christ. It's just like marriage. The two became one. There is something divine, something supernatural. It's when Apostle Paul said, if you are in Christ. Now, the creature there, you know, ang sagwa pa no creature, bagong creature. It's like you, you are a new, but the, the, the idea is that you, there is something new in you. The word creature really refers to bringing something into existence which has not existed before. Okay? Let me give you an example. But before that, it is the act of causing that which did not exist before. The best example I can really say is me. For illustration purposes, before I became a Christian, I never thought in my life I'd become a preacher or a pastor. Never in my radar screen told me, Richie, in 
the future you'll become a preacher. No way. Never in my plan. And another example is that uh, when I became a Christian, when I gave myself to God and surrendered myself to God, before I, be, before I was a Christian, my music was a little bit of a hardcore, like, you know, I like Nirvana, you like, you know, those Nirvana, and I like Metallica. <laughs> and you go like that. That was before. But when I became a Christian, somebody gave me a guitar, and suddenly I became playing guitar songs and worship to God. That was not before. Do you get the point now? Something new happened. That's why when Paul said, if anyone is in Christ, if you're in union in Christ, there is something new that happened inside you. Something that was not there before and something that is in now. Why? Because the old things pass away. Behold, the new things have come. In short, in Christ, you are made what? Brand new. Inside you, there's just newness. There's new hope, new horizons, something. And you really understand this something new if you again are a true believer. And let me show you a picture. It's like this. When you look at the mirror, if you are in Christ, you probably, your reflection of the mirror really is that, you know, that, I don't want to mention it, but probably some will get hurt. But, you know, the mature guy. But if you are in Christ, the truth is, even if the reflection is the mature guy in Christ, you are young, you are strong, because you are brand new. Get the idea? Another picture is this. You probably are still a kitten, but when you look at the mirror, because you are now in Christ, you are a lion. You are in Christ and there's something in there that is new. Okay? So the advantages, one of the greatest things when you are in Christ is your history does not determine your identity nor does it set your destiny. Whatever you are in your life, when you are now identified in Christ, your past no longer defines you. Your past no longer defines your future. Now, before I get to the main point, let me again strike a balance here because many can really say, by the way, this born again teaching, this is the teaching or the doctrine of regeneration. We are regenerated and God can only cause that. But there are times also that people will claim, I'm a Christian. Sometimes they, they, if they wear t-shirts, I'm a Christian, they're already a Christian. Even put tattoo, you know, Jesus Saves. They don't even understand. Oh, Jesus Saves. Okay. They, people can really claim they're a Christian. Right? But the, my, my, what I'm going to talk about here is that are we really identified with Christ? Because if we really are in Christ, there is something that will happen in you and from the inside, it will affect the outside. And there is an output that will happen in your life. For example, or let me give you that verse. You see, in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 to 10, it says there, For by grace you have been saved. God saved us. God actually redeemed us. God actually gave us a new life. And that of yourselves, it is a what? It is a gift of God. Not, not as a result of work so that no one may boast. In verse 9, For we are His workmanship. We are His poem. We are His obra maestra. Created in what? In Christ Jesus, in union with Christ, we are created with Christ for a purpose, and that is what? For good works. The good works that God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. This is the picture. If we really are believers of Christ, if we really are in Christ, and if we really are identified with Christ, there's a certain output in our lives that tells us that you are true. Amen. Amen. Two, two examples, two, two illustrations. Oh, but before the illustration, why could I say that? Why? Because the half-brother of Jesus, who is James, also said this. What use is it, my, is it? What use is it? What profits? 
Well, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, when someone says I am a true Christian, but has no what? No works, no output. Even so, if it has no works, that claim of you that you believe in God is what? Is dead. Two examples I want to give you. There was an artist in 1800s by the name of Paul Gustave Dore. Paul Gustave Dore. He was a renowned artist in Europe. Everybody knew him. One day he traveled but he lost his passport. And the immigration guard said, can I, can I have your passport? And he said, I lost my passport, but I am, I am a renowned artist. My name is Paul Gustave Dore. And the guard said, no, I don't believe you. Give me your passport. Or prove to me that you are. So what he did is that, can I ask for a paper and a pen and a pencil? And so the artist drew a landscape that he saw skillfully, beautifully, and put his name right there and gave it to the guard and said, here it is, here's my proof. You see, what he did is this. His work validated his word. Amen, church. So works, the good works that God planned is also an evidence and a proof that you are truly are in Christ. Another example is this. Another example is this. Let me show this a picture. You know what this is? What this is? Girls, do you like this? Men, do you like this? <laughs> okay. All right. So, this is a diamond. This is a precious stone. But don't you know that diamonds, mine diamonds are actually made underground. They are made by uh, in carbon, you know, fossils. And by the pressure of the land, inside it, the, the, the stone is formed in ye by years and by the pressure and the heat. And then the diamond actually is formed. In the, this is God's creation. And there's a mysterious way how God did this. But in 1955, General Electric actually invented a machine to simulate the process of making diamonds. Why? Because diamonds not only are precious, they also have industrial applications. So General Electric made a machine in 1955. I don't know, probably they've you know, done better now. But they produced the same stones in the form of moissanite, if I'm not mistaken, moissanite. Now, the difference between the two is that the mined diamond and the simulated diamond, the only difference there is that the mined diamonds is true and the laboratory diamond is, what's the word? Fake. Tama? Now, but the only way or one of the ways to actually understand if this is real or fake is when, when someone actually examines it. So when someone sees, ah, yung four C's of a diamond, cut, carrot, clarity, and color. When somebody examines it, ah, this is real, this is not. Same as true with the, the Apostle Paul. He was talking that, you know what, this is the basis of faith. Salvation is based by grace. But James is also saying, you know what, if you truly are saved, there is an output. Okay, so let me put a statement here. God made salvation available by faith. Praise God. What He has provided is beyond human effort. He works salvation in the heat and pressure of Calvary. People cannot do that. Only God can. Salvation is God's creation. On the other hand, no one knows a diamond's genuineness until somebody examines it. Why am I sharing that, friends? Because we can claim we are Christians. We are claiming that, you know, I am identified with Christ, but there is no output. Okay? That's why a worthy but worthless faith is actually worthless because faith based on mere words and ritual will be unmasked as fakes. A worthy, puro sturya, pero walay buhat. Okay. In English, nalang to. Okay? So why am I sharing that, friends? Because if you are identified with Christ, when you are really genuine, there is an output that will happen in earth, certain areas, areas in our life. So today's message, the main point, let's read this together because this is the main point that we're going to talk about this morning. Let's read this. One, two, three, go. If you really are identified in Christ, 
then there is a certain output that will go to one, one aspect and spear in your life. And uh, the Bible is talking, there are actually basically three. And so later on, at the tail end of the message, I'll talk also about some practical things that we can do now, right here in CCF, as in now, okay? So the three areas that we will be talking about is that if you are in Christ, there are three areas that we will actually have some output. Number one, that is we being as disciples. If we are in Christ, we submit ourselves as disciples of Jesus Christ. Disciples meaning, the Greek word is matetes, meaning it, it, someone who accepts the instruction given to him and makes it his rule of conduct. Imagine, friends, if somebody says, yeah, I'm a Christian, I am in Christ, but he does not even go to the instruction of the Lord and be discipled by God. Is that real or not? Well, James is saying that faith probably is dead. Because if we are in Christ, we subject ourselves to the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. We become His disciple, and Jesus becomes our teacher. Amen? Acts 11.25 said, And when he had found him, he brought him into Antioch, and it came about that for an entire year, they met with the church and, and taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians. The truth is, if we are in Christ, we are disciples first before we can even claim we're Christians. We are disciples. And praise God that CCF actually, the main ministry of CCF is small group discipleship. Now, let me read to you this statement. As disciples, this is what we should do. If we are in Christ, this is what we are doing. We study scriptures. Have you ever met a person who claimed to be a Christian but never read the Bible? No one, nobody, right? Have you ever met a Christian who never practiced the discipline of prayer, of solitude, and meditation and reflection? Probably none. We learn from the teaching, training, and wisdom of godly leaders and teachers. And not only that, we create discipleship groups so that we can learn from each other. So the sphere of discipleship is where a true believer pours into because this is the output that is expected of us. We are disciples of Jesus. And that's why Paul even said, copy me as I copy Christ. Because he also disciples others as he disciples others going towards Christ. The second area, or by the way, what's the title again? One, two, three, go. Live like who you are. The second area is family. Family. Romans 8, 14 to 15 says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the what? The sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out what? Abba, Father. You know that if you are in Christ, if you really are a true believer, that you have a new spiritual family? So if anybody who claims, I am really a believer of Christ and does not belong to a spiritual family, that's a very questionable thing. Why? Because Romans says, you are a son of God. You and I have the same father. And if we come here, we call ourselves brothers and sisters. Because why? We are family. That's why I like it here in CCF and attracted me so much to here because there is no denomination here. We are a fellowship. We are a family. And we can practice family, you know, spiritual family here in this fellowship. Therefore, you are no longer slave but son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Imagine. We can call our dad Abba, Father, and we are also heirs of God. And inside the family, there's a certain conduct that we do. When Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, Do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather what appeal to him as a father. 
Because even if you are brothers and sisters, there are certain conducts. If they're older men that I have and they need rebuke, I would appeal to them as a father, to the younger man as brothers, to the older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters. In all what? In all purity. Because some would twisted mind would say, oh, don't love one another. Merong sister doon. I love, will love her also. But the truth is, it would be in all purity. You love her in the love of God, not in the love of lust. Okay? So there's certain conducts inside the family. Alright? So if you're an in Christ, if you're a real Christian, you have a spiritual family and your works go into that. Your output goes towards that sphere. Another sphere, or by the way, as family, we prefer one another and what? Love for one another. We enjoy being together and we hold one another accountable. Meaning, when we have fellowship, we enjoy. Do you think, why, why, why those true believers really like, you know, kung pwede lang every night tayo magkita, okay, masaya, di ba? Some would actually say, oh, can we have overnight prayer meetings? And then after the overnight prayer meetings, and then we, we have fellowship again. You see, this is family. Do you like being with family? And you have a new spiritual family if you are in Christ. Live like, you, live like who you are. The third spear is that we, are, we need to put out or there's an output as missionaries. Missionaries. Now, the word missionaries, do not be intimidated. Okay? Takot na kayo maging missionary, no? But the truth is, if you're in Christ, there's a sense of being missionaries. Why? This is what Jesus said in John 20, 21. Jesus therefore said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I also... Do you know that Jesus was a missionary? If the Father sent Jesus, He said, I will also send you. Okay? And then, now all these things are from God who reconciled us to Him through Christ and gave us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. As missionaries, this is one of our ministry, ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and He has committed to us what? The word of all believers, all those who are in Christ, God committed to us the word of reconciliation, and that is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You have it. I have it. And because we have it, therefore we are what? We are ambassadors for Christ. You like to be an ambassador? Ambassador to the Philippines. Our citizenship is in heaven, right? And we are ambassadors for the Philippines. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were entreating to us. We beg you in behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. There are things in our life that sometimes we say, oh, hindi na kailangan yan. But you know what? If you are really in Christ, there really is a passion. There is a passion to put in, to just put your, to, to, to just give effort in the ministry of reconciliation because we are called to be missionaries also. So, as missionaries, we live a life of mission. We share the gospel winsomely and commend the gospel by our words and action. We seek to make God's invisible kingdom visible and tangible to the people around us. That's why our title is Live Like Who You Are. Now, the question, my friends, is if these are the three spears, three spears in our life that the Bible is teaching us, that our output, in, if we are in Christ, that we would put that good works into. How do we do this now in our contemporary time? How do we do this now in my personal life right now? Isn't that a good question? How? How do we do these things? So, I'm giving out again some practical advice, practical things in line of the lesson this morning and in line, of course, with the principle of the Bible that we can actually do right now. Letter L, let me tell you, letter L. Look unto Jesus. Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever been struggling in your prayer life? 
Have you, are, are, there, are those days when you are actually having problems in reading your Bible? Have you have days when you have this, when you have this, uh, what do you call that? Bible calendar that we give. And then one of your D group is already in the New Testament. And I am still in Genesis chapter 5. And you're saying, ayoko na lang magbasa. Have you have struggles in your spiritual disciplines of solitude, of meditation? Are there times that you are just so distracted? Are there times that you just don't, ah, ayoko na God, I just want, I want to quit. Are there times that you, you, you just don't want to listen more in the, in the council of your D-group leaders, in your pastors? You just don't want to do it anymore and you just want to end it now. Have you had those times in your life? You know what, friend, if you are in Christ, and God is saying, you know what, you need to have an output in discipleship. And you need to be the disciple of Jesus Christ. And you have struggles into reading the Bible, in praying, in solitude, in meditating the Word. Number one practical example that I can give you, or number one practical suggestion that I want to give you right now, is look into or unto Jesus. You know why you need to look unto Jesus? Because Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. If there is something that you're in question of, when there is something that is a problem with your faith, when you say, you know, Lord, mas mabuti pa sila. they have no problems. I have so many problems, Lord God. I'd rather go be there. But you know what? If you have that problem and struggle in your life, go back. Look unto Jesus. You know why? Because Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. You go back to Him. You go back to His feet and said, God, I need you. I want to fix my eyes on you. No longer I want to see those problems, the pleasures, the problems, the stress, and everything, Lord God, in between. I just want to set my eyes on you. Because I am your disciple. You are my master. And no one else will I look except you. Look unto Jesus. Isn't that good, friends? Isn't that not encourage you when you are right now, you're coming over here, you said, ayoko nang mapunta ng CCF, pagod na ako, kapoy na kayo, sikigad to dito eh. Lamig lang kayo dito matulog. Kasi malamig. In English, I'm happy. I don't know what. But you know what, friends? I'm encouraging you right now. Look unto where? Look unto... Jesus, fix your eyes, set your eyes upon, set your sights on Jesus. Why? Because He is the author and the finisher of our faith. It starts and ends with Jesus. Second, letter I, invest in discipleship. We said that if you are in Christ, then we need to be disciples of God. And not only that, we need to submit to His discipleship. And praise God for CCF, because our main ministry is discipleship. Our main ministry is small group discipleship. We do not do anything else except discipleship. That's why we don't have feeding programs. We do not have, you know, uh, jail ministry. Some D groups do that. But the CCF Dabao, the main efforts are poured in into discipleship in small groups. That's why we need to invest in discipleship. You know, Discipleship is costly. But not investing in discipleship is more costly. You know why is it costly? Because it needs our time. It needs our effort. It needs our treasure. Kasi papunta dito, it will cost us. Tama? It will need to, you know, move our schedules around. But if you do invest in discipleship, if there is a will, there will always be if you don't, there will always be an excuse. Traffic, walang tubig, walang kuryente, wala akong pera, wala akong Bible, wala ako dito. Diba? There will always be an excuse. Always be an excuse. Always. But I'm encouraging you right now. Since you are what? In Christ. And one of the sphere that we need to pour our lives into is what? The being what? disciples. So submit yourself in the discipleship of Christ. And if you know, one, know, know more of discipleship, let me show to you 
the process of discipleship here in CCF. And if you've been wondering what is that flag ba yan ng CCF? The yan flag ng CCF, okay? That's what we call the discipleship process. This is how we do discipleship here. If you are a believe, a, you don't believe in Christ, then you know submit yourself into the evangelist, into the, the 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 good news. So believe by faith that Jesus is your Savior and Lord. And if you want to grow in faith, then join a small group. And if you want to start your own group, be mentored by the leaders. And if you want to uh, lead your people to make more groups, then be empowered. So this is the discipleship process. If you yourself want to submit to the discipleship of God, we are putting a tool here, but ultimately, God is the discipler. But God is using D-group leaders, pastors, D-12 leaders here in CCF. But if you go to the tail end of this process, and you're only saying, now I want to do the same, for those people who discipled me, I want also to disciple, then this is what you will do. You need to connect. Then you make them believe. Then you make them grow. You make them mentor and multiply. So those two right there are two ways. You be discipled and then you to disciple. Amen, church? So invest. Wherever you are right now, invest in there. Invest your time. You know, mahal din magbili ng pagkain sa D-group, ha? But if you meet here, there's bread talk. Ah. But you know what? That's true. It's, it costs, right? Do you need to what? You need to? You need to watch what's the word? Invest. Because investing into something means that is where your output is. And the best return of this, my friend, is not only for your retirement, the return is what? Eternal. Imagine, friends, those people whom you brought to Christ's feet and then they believe in Jesus. And one day, if they really are in Christ and you are also in Christ and you see them in heaven, you say, Bro, praise God. Ikaw talaga yung ginamit ni God. Ba kaya nandito ako? Isn't that gonna be a wonderful, eternal feeling for the rest of eternity? Of course, yes. I don't know about you, but I'd wait for that day and all of those people that I have shared and ministered to. Now, one day we meet in heaven and said, Oh, thank you. Submit to discipleship and invest in discipleship. You know why? It will have eternal returns. Letter F. Fellowship. Fellowship. We said that if you are in Christ, then there's new spiritual family. We need to fellowship with other believers. We need to... <laughs> I don't know how to say this more, but you see, friends, sometimes I notice when I go from church to church and area to area, I see some people would just come to church and just come to church and then leave. Have you ever noticed that? You probably have seen some faces here, not in your D group, but you know what? You have seen that face for so many years, but you never reached out your hand and say, Hi, bro, I love you with the love of the Lord. And have you ever seen a Christian who never went to fellowship? Like, you know, he comes in, zhik, 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 zhik. Sino ba yung tao na yan? But you see, friends, we can apply this. We need to fellowship with other believers. Why? If you are in Christ, one is the main sphere is that we have a new spiritual family. And we need to fellowship with other believers. Why? Because our love to God is measured by our everyday fellowship with others and the love it displays. We say we love God, but God said, love those that you need to love my people too. And in fellowship, we are able to translate our love to God by loving others as well. Finally, friends, in letter, letter F, word life, engage the world. Engage the world through witnessing. Why? Because one sphere is that we are missionaries. So we need to engage the world through witnessing. 
And so, Acts 1.8 said, But you will what? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Meaning you are really in Christ because the Holy Spirit now dwells in you. And you shall be my what? My witnesses. You see, some Christians, you know, they are God-loving people would say, that, my witness, you know, sharing the gospel is not my part. But when Jesus said this to the disciples, including you, if you're a believer in Christ, He says, you, meaning it's a personal level. Witnessing to others is not the job of the pastor, the D-group leader, the 12 leader, or the senior pastor. Witnessing is a responsibility of every believer because Jesus said, you. Does it include you? So, witnessing is in a personal level. That's why if you really are in Christ, you are a missionary in your own right because you will witness to other, other people what God has done into your life and who God is. You witness in a personal. You don't, you don't have to get, you see friends, you don't have to be a seminary graduate and say to, and say to the person you want to witness, you know what? The theology of the true living God is this. You don't need that. All you need is who God is in your life. You know, God is good. Even if I'm a sinner, He loves me. Christ died for me. Now I am new. Now I am His. And I am, now I am, He is mine and I am His. That's it. In a personal level. And you don't even have to worry about how to do it. You know why? Because God has given you the... The word power there is dunamis. It's an explosive power, by the way. Something that you don't have before also. But now you have it. Something so great that you can boldly say that I am a believer of Christ. You know what, friend? What is brutal? For example, you know that you now hold the cure of cancer. And your friend suffers in a stage 100 cancer. Grabbing sobra talaga. And then you come to your friend and say, I have the cure. Pero stage 100 ka na eh. I'm not gonna give you the cure. The same is true with all of us. We know that the only way to heaven is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. And you go to your friends and you see their friends that they are really lost. You see your brothers. You see your mother. You see your sister. You see everyone else. These are completely lost. But you don't give them the antidote of being lost because God will find them. You don't share to them the cure. You don't share to them the gospel. Isn't that brutal? Amen? So, you shall be my what? Witnesses. So friends, in a practical sense, in a practical sense, you know, everything that I have just taught you, the first part, we just look unto Jesus. Why? If you have struggles in your life, if you think your past is not is defining you, no, look into Jesus. I am in Christ. And invest in discipleship. It's costly, but it's worth it. Fellowship with other believers because we are a spiritual family. And then engage the world through witnessing. We witness who Christ is. Finally, friends, let me close you with this powerful, powerful, powerful verse that is my life verse, and I want to share this to you, and may it also be your life verse. The Apostle Paul say, so, uh, said something so powerful in the book of Galatians that I will, I will always, always have in my heart. It is found in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It says there, I have been crucified with Christ. <laughs> I have been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life, this life I live now, this life, I look into Jesus. I invest in discipleship. I will fellowship with my fellow believers. I will evangelize the world or I will engage in witnessing. You know what? This is going to be my life. In this life which I now live in the flesh. <laughs> Hallelujah. No longer I myself. Because Christ lives in me. No longer I, because you know what? This I, I have crucified with Christ. And the life I live now, I live for the Son of God. 
I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave him up, who gave himself up for me. You see, friends, if you are identified with Christ, no longer you. It's no longer I. You know why? If it's I always identify myself with I, I will always say I'm the loser guy. I always say, you know what? This is a useless life. But if I identify myself in Christ, then whatever my past is, whatever my insecurities are, whatever the things that I did before, whatever mistakes I did, whatever the success I did, whatever I drive, whatever I wear, whatever the color of my skin, whatever my education is, whatever I am in life right now, I am identified with Christ. And I'm going to be identified with Him because He loves me and He died for me and I'm going to give my life to Him. Amen? Isn't that the very wonderful thing? I live an exchange life. No longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And if I live in Christ, and if I'm in Christ, then I'm going to pour my life into this. I will look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. I will submit myself into discipleship. I will fellowship with fellow believers. And I will witness because I love Jesus. And I can only love Jesus because He loves me. And that, my friend, is the most powerful calling you and I can do. You know why? Because if you are in Christ, then that will manifest in your life. But if you're not, you have the chance. Humble yourself. Submit yourself to the authority of Christ. Live. Live. Live like who you are. Live like who you are. You are in Christ. You are in Christ. Live like who you are. Don't be ashamed. Don't be alarmed. Don't be bothered by your past. Don't be so cruel to yourself. Live like who you are. God loves you and He will forever take care of you until eternity. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's clap our hands. And so stand up and say our last, and say the closing prayer. God, Lord, we thank you. You thank you that you sent your own son to die on the cross so that we may have life. Life that is so abundant, as you said in John chapter 10, verse 10. Life so abundant. Life of overflowing life. And I pray, Lord God, that as this message penetrates our bones, oh Lord God, that we would be able to apply this, Lord God, in our own little way. Because we are your disciples. Lord, I pray that as we come here with different needs, some of us here come in different troubles in our lives. Some are searching. Some are seeking. Some need wisdom. Some need healing. Some need, Lord God, financial provision. All of us here, Lord God, have different problems. But I pray today, Lord God, that you will be able, Lord God, to just provide everything we need. As we give our life to you, you promise, Lord God, that you're going to take care of us because we are your children. We are your family. And we can cry to you, Abba, Abba Father. And no father, <laughs> you even said Jesus, that even you, earthly father, when your son asks for bread, you don't give them stone. How about you, our loving father? We ask for healing. We ask for restoration in our relationship. We ask for provision, Lord God. All of these things we need, Lord God, to survive this world. We need your provision, Lord God, and especially we need you. And so today, Lord God, may all of these needs be met by you so that we can give honor and glory to you. But today, Lord God, as we go out this place, may we never be the same again. And as we go out this place, we will say, no longer I who live, but you live in me. Because I have crucified myself in Christ. And I now live by faith in you, Jesus, who died for me. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say, Amen. Amen.